Welcome to the Appalachian Mountains. Let's get this out of the way early. Some of y'all don't say that correctly. Appalachia. That name is derived from a native language. In the Appalachia's native language, it's derived from Apala, meaning great sea, and Chi, meaning those by the sea. The Appalachians lived what is now considered Florida, but the Cherokee, who actually lived and thrived in these mountains, called this area the Shikonahe, or land of the blue mist. Now we call it the Blue Ridge, and I love it here. I grew up here, but much like the water we're going to discuss today, I was gravitationally pulled to the ocean and managed to eventually find my way back home to these mountains. Speaking of mountains, did you know that the longest mountain range on the planet is actually underwater? It's 10 times longer than the biggest mountain range on land. Most people don't know that. The deepest point in the ocean is Challenger Deep, just east of the Philippines, with the highest point on land being Mount Everest, straddling Nepal and China. If you were to take Mount Everest and place it in the bottom of Challenger Deep, its summit would still be over a mile from the surface. Now, here's one that most people do know. It's a statistic that we, as humans, share with Earth. We are mostly water. The human body, depending on how hydrated we are, is between 50 and 70 percent water. The Earth is 71 percent water. This leaves a mere 29 percent for dry land, which, as an air-breathing, land-roaming mammal, might sound slightly limiting, but to even begin to comprehend the vastness of water on this planet, it is key to wrap your consciousness around the fact that that number, 71 percent, is merely accounting for Earth's spherical surface. It doesn't even begin to explain the volume of water that holds most of this planet's life beneath its ripples. The vast majority of life on Earth is underwater. A surprising 94% of all species are aquatic. Now, how many of you have looked underwater before? Raise your hand if you went snorkeling or diving and looked underwater before. Nice. So some of you get it. But now keep your hand raised if you have looked underwater here in these mountains before. Sweet. <laughs> Most of the people work with me, so they don't, they don't count. <laughs> people flock to these mountains to enjoy the water that flows so abundantly, to visit the waterfalls, to fish, to paddle the rivers, all of which provides an amazing view from above. But if you were to look beneath the surface, you would find that southern Appalachia is surrounded by the most biodiverse freshwater in all of North America. Our streams and rivers here are intertwined with the rest of Earth's water, in a connected cycle that we all learn about in elementary school, but we never truly have a grasp on how profound it is. These mountains we are sitting on make up the Eastern Continental Divide. This means that depending on which side of the mountain range that a raindrop falls determines whether it will go to the Atlantic or the Gulf. Some of the rain falling on these mountains today will still be traveling to the ocean 300 years from now. And man, do we get some rain. 
We are surrounded by a temperate rainforest. We don't have orangutans, but it is a rainforest, with rainforests being some of the most biodiverse ecosystems on land, and coral reefs being the most biodiverse underwater. No wonder I love them both. Water not only pours from the sky, but it gushes from the ground. This water picks its path to lower elevations, hiding abundant life beneath the surface. And sometimes, ancient treasures, like 25 million year old megalodon teeth. So much like one of our mentioned raindrops, I started off here, and I was obsessed with making my way to the ocean. And naturally, I carved my way to the Atlantic first, and the flow of life took me to oceans across the globe. I became a marine professional, licensed to work at sea, and I was never coming back here. But that's not how the cycle works now, is it? I never really knew how special the place I grew up is. The ocean is a wild, unpredictable temptress, and she calls my name endlessly. But after a bad back injury in Hawaii, I came home barely able to touch my chin to my chest. I was devastated to be back here. But these mountains and their icy cold water were just the healing I needed. I already knew that water was my biggest addiction, but I soon learned that water is scientifically on a physiological level, healing. Blue mind is the mildly meditative state that people fall into when they are near, in, on, or under the water. Biochemical levels shift just by looking at water, let alone submersing yourself. In solids, atoms are locked in place. In gases, they're chaotic but in liquid, they flow. Negative ionization happens whenever water collides with itself, like in a wave or in a waterfall. Negative ionization can have a positive effect on everything from our air quality to our personal health. So we reap the benefits just by being around. Going on six months with a debilitating back injury, the thing that felt the best was to just lay in the river and let it pull traction. It washed away the pain, both mental and physical. Now, at this point in my life, I had spent thousands of hours underwater, and I was well-versed in marine life, but I still hadn't bothered to look under the surface here in my own backyard. I swim, I paddle, I'm out on the boat a lot. I thought I was experiencing fresh water to the fullest extent, until I read an article about river snorkeling. My back was getting better, and I was getting back to teaching scuba. Snorkeling sounded a little less exciting, but I'm a nerd, and my interests were piqued. So I started researching, and it brought me to send a lengthy email to a local freshwater biologist. After some mild harassment on my part, I was lucky enough to hear back from Kevin Merrill, the owner of Oxbow River Snorkeling, who's now a dear friend and a business partner. Kevin took me on my first ever river snorkeling expedition. And to be honest, I had low expectations. As someone that had been diving on world-renowned reefs, been in a submersible to 750 feet deep, and seen a bucket list of ocean creatures, I couldn't help but wonder, how much is there to really see in one foot of fresh water? I went into the trip with curiosity and I proceeded to be mind-blown. The Appalachian region is a true freshwater treasure, home to hundreds and hundreds of native fish species, many of them now being endangered. Some of these colorful specimens 
would fool you into dreaming of the tropics. But they only reside in a few pristine mountain streams, thriving in icy cold, heavily oxygenated flow, making these waterways a living museum of evolution. A hidden world of aquatic insects fuels the Appalachian food web. Mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies, all ultra-sensitive to pollution, serve as living indicators of stream health. Their brief but vital lives shape the survival of fish, amphibians, and even the forests around them. Our rivers also shelter freshwater mussels, some of which can live for up to 100 years, individually filtering gallons of water per day, keeping entire ecosystems alive while barely moving an inch. Now, their lack of allure to the general public has led them to be one of the most endangered animal groups in all of the United States, with most people not even knowing they exist, despite their ecological importance. And perhaps the most sought-after site for some, one of the oldest and largest amphibians on the entire planet, our famous hellbender salamander, another living link to prehistoric times. In fact, the Appalachian region has more diverse salamander species than anywhere else on Earth, with many of them being endemic, found nowhere else but right here. And yet, the aquatic animal that gets the most attention are trout. Now, don't get me wrong, Trout are iconic, and they're a beautiful fish. But most of the fish that people come here to catch aren't even native. They're stocked, backed by substantial species support programs. These captive-raised populations are released to depend on delicate ecosystems, with roots that run much deeper than we realize. The depths hold sturgeon, time travelers of the river, and paddlefish, true marvels of evolutionary design. These living fossils have remained relatively unchanged for over a hundred million years. To put it in perspective, dinosaurs roamed on land while these fish swam the waters below. Perfectly adapted, they represent a lineage that has survived ice ages, mass extinctions, and shifting continents. But the true question is, will they survive us? Dammed rivers, industrial runoff, overdevelopment, and unconscious use by locals and visitors alike. Our living laboratory of evolutionary wonders is at risk of being lost in the historical equivalence of a blink of an eye. When it comes to these mountains, we've been quick to admire the beauty at a surface level and very slow to recognize the importance of the life beneath the surface. And despite the environment declining, we're still finding new species which means we are losing what we have before we even know we have it. So right now, we need more voices speaking for those that cannot. We need to support conservation and awareness. And I'd like to mention that we need to pay very close attention to the debris cleanup that's going on in our rivers right now. Yes. <laughs> it has the potential to become an entire other disaster on top of Helene. But perhaps most of all, we need to create conscious explorers that become passionate about the places they love. 
We need more people sticking their faces underwater and seeing what there is to see. I genuinely believe the only way that one can truly have an affinity for the natural world is to experience it firsthand, to spend time in it, to feel connected. I have spent my entire life sharing the love of water with other people in hopes to foster a connection between us above and those below. I hope that by sharing the depths of life on this planet, we can better understand the importance of our aquatic ecosystems, both fresh and salt, shallow and deep, and give them the recognition that they deserve. My name is Isha. I teach people to breathe underwater. I operate here locally in North Carolina, as well as on an international scale. And wherever you are, I hope that you take this as an open invitation to look beneath the surface and form a deeper connection with yourself and the life that surrounds you on this very watery planet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.